had the signaling conference, which, which you referred to, which was quite impressive. But when something happens on services, it happens at a time of high anticipation of results in Agamemnon. So there is a certain dynamic in the single undertaking, uh, uh, negotiating that thing. Everything is linked, particularly when you look at the market access field, the triangle is linked. It cuts both ways. When things work, they do work for the three. When things don't work, they don't work for the three also. So there is a bit of a, of a problem there. But you need the political will to get the triangle moving. The second problem I'm referring to here is an institutional hurdle in negotiating services. And I will explain this in the most diplomatic way possible. In services negotiations, typically the negotiating ministry is different from the regulating or the policy setting ministry. And with the diversity of services sectors and policy and regulatory frameworks involved, you need to close that gap. You need to make sure that actually people who are responsible for certain sectors are sitting on the negotiating table, because these are the ones who not only have the mandate to decide on what to recommend to the policymakers, but they, they are the ones who would understand what certain demands uh, or certain offers would mean. And there is a need, of course, you will say that we involve sectoral experts in the negotiations in Geneva. Of course we do that. The problem is the level at which the engagement takes place is typically not a policy making or a decision making level at, the, uh, at those sectoral negotiations. Uh, the contrast is look at accession negotiations. Why do things happen? Because there is higher level of political leadership. I, I am not going to suggest the, the way to bridge that institutional gap, but there is an institutional hurdle here in the services negotiations that, that we need to, 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 to cross. I know I'm preaching to the converted, but, but I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done, and the role of the <coughs> private sector is going to be crucial in mobilizing the political will, but also in suggesting ways to overcome the institutional hurdle. I know I haven't answered all your questions, though. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to the Aditya, <laughs> what's, uh, what's on the table? What's at work? technical assistance. Okay. Uh, let me begin. <coughs> I'll address three questions. On. One, whether the reality of services negotiation matches the promise. Uh, the second, whether trade negotiations and services in fact matter, whether they matter for development, whether they matter for business. And the third question is whether we can do better than we have done if these negotiations in fact do matter. Let me begin by showing you a picture, which is the world as it is today. This is a new database that we have been putting together at the World Bank and will soon be made public. It shows on the horizontal axis the per capita income of countries and on the vertical axis the restrictiveness of services trade policy measured in an extremely crude way. And what we see is an interesting picture. First of all, you see that the rich countries are indeed open on average. But there is a high degree of heterogeneity when it comes to the services policies of the poor country. Could I have the pointer, please? There was uh, the one with the pointer which, you, which I tried out earlier. Thank you. Now, many poor countries, those are the ones that are clustered towards the origin there, have had openness thrust upon them thanks to my institution, the World Bank or the IMF. But many other countries, and there you see some of the fastest growing countries 
in Asia, China, India, Malaysia, have today among the most restrictive policies in services. As you turn to the sectoral picture, you notice something interesting, that telecommunications, finance, and retail are open. There has been significant unilateral liberalization. And it indeed follows the per capita picture. The larger countries, the richer countries, are the most open. I think you'll have to trust me from now on. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the bottom line is this, that some of the sectors which are the most protected are sectors like transport and the movement of professionals. And these are the sectors where it's not just the poor countries, but the rich countries which continue to restrict competition. And one of the ironies of the GATS negotiations is that it's precisely these areas which are de facto not even being seriously negotiated. Transport is off the table, virtually, and mode four isn't being negotiated with any great degree of seriousness. When you look at the offers and actual policy, and I was going to show you wonderful, colorful charts, which one day will be available on the internet, but what you see is a huge gap. Hamid said that there isn't any serious liberalization. That's not the point. The bindings are hovering way above reality. The GATS is playing catch up with reality, and it's not succeeding. The offers today, the best offers, are nowhere near what people are doing in actual practice. Now, does this matter? What should we be aiming for? Should we be content with simply binding the status quo? which is no mean task even now, because as I said, it's been a long way from achieving it. Or should we be aiming for substantial liberalization? Do we really believe that we are going to get a change in services policy on the altar of negotiation? Now some would say no. There is a huge difficulty of making the required legislative changes. Some would say the ponderous pace of services negotiations of the WTO will always be outstripped by the blistering pace of technological change. But you need to decide what is the level of ambition that is reasonable. Because we know that openness matters. The pictures I showed you, or would have shown you, indicate that countries are coming to the uh, a, a unilateral realization of the benefits of openness. Many of them have moved already. Telecom monopolies, transport monopolies, state controlled banking is a thing of the past. But many still restrict entry. Many, especially in Asia, insist on local ownership. How much do these residual restrictions matter? Now, in some areas where we heard a lot about cross-border trade and services, and here, openness has enabled services trade to flourish. But over this hangs sometimes a Democles sword of protectionism. Now, here, perhaps, if we could just lock in the openness that exists, we could dispel this specter of protection forever. Now, if the WTO could do nothing but say, let's lock in the openness that exists, I think that would be a remarkable achievement. And it's a reflection on the gap so far that we are a long way even from doing that. But there are other areas. We have heard about India and China and what reforms they have implemented. But there are domestic political vested interests that prevent further liberalization in retail, in legal services, in insurance, in banking. Now here, reciprocity, that powerful mechanism that has delivered openness in goods, could be mobilized in services. But for that to work, there is need also for a symmetric willingness to realize not just the large gains that would come from more open foreign investment, but the large gains that would come from greater freedom of mobility of people. <laughs>